Hey guys, welcome back to Contest Prep University. This is part three in our training feature and with me again, Dr. Eric Helms. Eric, I wanted to save you for last because I wanna spend a lot of time digging into the actual research. So just as a review, in case you're stumbling across this as the first swing at the series, part one, I talked to Ryan Connolly, who is the owner of Anger Management Strength Training. So a, a coach's perspective, somebody who's got all the methodologies, all of the, the different schools of thought, and, and what he does with different client populations. Then Austin Kiergaard, an NGA pro, and we really dug into what works for us as two anecdotal case studies, two pro bodybuilders. This is how we started our careers. This is where we meandered through all kinds of different training philosophies, and here's what we know now. Uh, so that was a lot of fun in a very layman practical way. And now, Eric, as, as you mentioned off camera, you've done all those things, but you're also a researcher. So I wanted to go through what you see as, as very specific steps in the research methodology that has brought us to the point we are today in 2020 and, and, and really parsing into some of those variables that people have to manipulate because we know when you start debating training intensity and training volume and training frequency, all those things, obviously there is a place for all of them, but a more sequential place in a, in a, in a way to apply them that's going to work. So uh, with all that said, I'm going to just kind of ask you to spill your brain on the table, but let's start with your background. Just uh, what got you into training and, you know, whatever day that was, you started, you know, lifting that, that first weight, how has that progressed? Well, it's, it's, that's a great question. And it's an honor to talk about this. Um, and I've worn all those hats and actually I've worn those hats in the specific order that you uh, align the, 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 the series. So I think it's interesting because I have each one of those light bulb moments through each phase of my career has informed my previous perspective. So um, that could be seen as, as a good thing or biased or depending on, on what angle you're looking at it. So yeah, so for me, I started lifting in 04 when I was 21. And it's funny that you mentioned uh, Ryan's company, Anger Management. I, was, <laughs> I started training to deal with some uh, some, some traumatic things that were going on in my life at that time uh, and just my kind of situation. And it was very much almost this kind of masochistic relationship with the iron and this catalyst for expressing um, myself and, 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 and uh, getting emotion out. So of course, you know, with that masochistic relationship, I eventually became a bodybuilder. It just makes sense. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I began training with a very serious intent to get big, strong. And then that actually turned into the desire to compete in bodybuilding and strength sport, uh, which materialized in 06. I did my first powerlifting meet. Uh, 05, I became a trainer. And then I did my first bodybuilding season in 07. Um, and I think if you kind of put a box around just me as the meathead, that hasn't changed at all. I'm still very much uh, really, really interested in becoming as big and strong as I can. And anything that's related to the iron game I'm, I'm into, whether that's strongman, weightlifting, powerlifting, bodybuilding um i'm down um now to the segue from that background was that as a coach as a trainer and then eventually starting 3dmj and being a you know a bodybuilding and strength athlete coach coaching people with similar interests to myself um i had to stay up with best practice but i would say that selfishly my initial interest in research and trying to take a more empirical approach to inform my training um, was to keep progress going and um, to, to figure out how to turn over the next stone, how to break the next plateau, and to um, alleviate some of the, you know, the discourse where, you know, you had people on two sides of a, you know, self-conceived fence, uh, whether that's the volume intensity debate, the failure or no failure debate, the high frequency or low frequency debate, all the things we see in the Iron Game where, you know, the disciples have their own dogma from their uh, muscular person on high who they pray to. And I figured there had to be a better way than just saying, well, Hey, this big guy did it because Hey, if they both did something different, they can't both be right, but they both, both also can't be both completely wrong. So I thought, uh, probably a better way to do it was through the scientific method. So that's kind of the short answer. Mm -hmm. So let's, uh, let, let's talk about some other things. You, you specifically mentioned that there were debates out there, frequency, volume, intensity, that kind of thing. Uh, in your early career, First of all, how did you even decide how to train? You picked up that first barbell, 
you know, what, what did you do? Were you going to magazines, websites? Yeah. Now you got to start somewhere. And I, I uh, tapped a, uh, a friend of mine. I was in the military at the time, a guy named Patrick, who was uh, on the air force, made the station at the same place who had a muscular physique and he whipped out none other than Arnold encyclopedia of modern bodybuilding. And that's how he first introduced me to some of the basic principles, like how many big movements do you have? How many times to train a muscle group in a week? Do you go to failure? What rep range do you train in? And it was all based on the anecdotes of, you know, seven time Mr. Olympia, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and, uh, in his book and with some, you know, kind of, uh, experiential learnings that I got from training with someone who had been, been a, a recreational bodybuilder for a while. Um, and then I started to read magazines and I got on the bodybuilding.com forums back, I think in 05, I first jumped on there and I found out, uh, eventually there's this thing called natural bodybuilding. So I started following what, what were the, the natural bodybuilding guys doing because people were telling me how oh, you can't follow the pros that that's all, you know, for some reason their, their physiology is totally different because they're on gear, which is probably partially true and partially not true. And, um, I think, I have always been a bit of a natural skeptic. I'd love to say that I've pulled myself up from my bootstraps and became the, the scientist that I am, but my mom tells stories of me at magic shows disappearing and finding me looking behind the curtain trying to figure out how they're doing it or being disappointed because I never believed in Santa Claus and just ruining our motherhood experience. So, um, so I think some of that just led me to, to instead of being enamored by the the gurus out there or the athletes and just wanted to do what they do to be like them. Um, whenever I heard something didn't make sense, just having an itch that I couldn't scratch. And I think that's what led me, led me down the path of, of science and, and trying to uh, modify what I originally started with. So it was initially just kind of the, uh, you know, the fraternity of, Hey, I'm going to take you in the gym and teach you how to do it. And we've got the Bible of, of Arnold. Uh, and then I, you know, found the, the subsequent scriptures from things like, uh, you know, muscle and fitness and flex and uh, Iron Man, et cetera. But uh, after that, I, I started to really think about what was logical and then pushing the boundaries of my own knowledge to, to see what might be more, quote unquote, towards the direction of optimal, if you will. Yeah. Well, to pull us up to where you are today and where I think current research is, I, I love that you started there, you know, Arnold's Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding. I am somebody who will always pay homage to Joe Weider and say, look, if, if there wasn't a guy like that creating what, what a lot of people make fun of now, you know, his, his Weider principles of, of this, this, or this, I mean, that's laying just, just sheer definitions down and how to principles that everybody followed for generations after that. Uh, now with the proliferation of, of information on the internet, of course, you know, there are myriad ways of, of dissecting and analyzing things. But my gosh, without that foundational step, I mean, you know, who knows where, where we would be. So, so I, I love that, you know, like you and me, a lot of people just started with that same information on how to do split training and, and how to divide up, you know, how much volume and intensity, you know, really makes up a quote, good workout. But like you, I it ironically started, um, I mean, although I was in the Air Force with you, or not with you, but I was in the Air Force as well. But my hunger for knowledge is what led me to my career. So mm -hmm. when I was 15 years old and I decided I will be Mr. Olympia someday, I thought if I'm going to be Mr. Olympia, I'm going to have to know something about nutrition. So after physical therapy school and, you know, just working my nine to five in, a, in an orthopedic clinic, you know, I'm, I'm taking classes. I'm, I'm working toward my PhD in nutrition with absolutely no other goal other than I just want to learn this so I can be bigger and stronger. Mm -hmm. So, you know, 25 years later, here we are now. And, and we've both won the, the, the Olympia trading off back to back years. Yeah. Well, I, I, I did let go of that goal. You know, I had two other goals, which was to compete by the time I was 21 and to turn pro by the time I was 30, uh, you know, check, check, Mr. Olympia, probably not going to happen. Um, but you know, I, I've still got time. Keep dream alive, Joe. I've got time. I got time. You know, another another solid 10, 10 years in me. I mean, Dexter Jackson just 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 took place really high and at the age of, of I think similar age to you. So you got this. Okay. Well, as soon as we're finished with this podcast, I am going to go train. So I I would be so fired up. I'll probably set a PR and and I'll do it. Make Love that twenty twenty goal. So so with all of that as our shared background, 
today when you look at research, and, and I, I know you keep up with all of the stuff coming out, that it's just incredibly prolific, you know, the, the research coming out of human performance labs and different researchers have so many different studies going on at the same time. When you frame those debates of the variables, and if you kind of sitting on top of the pyramid, we might call it the Dr. Helm strength pyramid. Uh, I hear there's a good book about that. Uh, you know, what would you say those variables have to be in somebody's mind and how do we manage them? Well, what, where do you start in your brain with creating a proper progression? Here's, here's somebody coming to you, you know, fresh. It's, it's the 21 year old Eric Helms who's gonna go to the gym for the first time. You know this person is gonna have a 20 or 30 year career and, and I'm sure you in your brain conceptualize it as progressions. You know, first mm -hmm. we have to work on this and that's gonna lead us to this and here's this. So, so go through that entire process in your mind. Yeah, so I think at the, the very earliest stage is when someone first steps into the, uh, into the gym to, to undertake their goal to become Mr. Olympia like we both have achieved, um, or, or Ms. Olympia. Um, the, 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 the essential first step is just basic motor learning, you know, just, just learning the, the skill set. And I think something that um, is sometimes undervalued when people juxtapose hypertrophy or strength to these different goals is that in the end, we're, we're using a lot of the same implements, you know, um, until something drastically changes in the way we approach training, you're going to need to become basically familiar with machines, dumbbells, barbells, et cetera. And I think getting the basic motor patterns down and, and repeated ways that you can at least move through the stages of, of learning until you have like conscious competence in a basic hip hinge squat, horizontal press, vertical press, horizontal pull, vertical pull. Uh, that should be step one. And I think um, really it, it, it almost doesn't matter what initial approach you take in, in a vacuum. I would just want you to learn. Of course, the time when you're most motivated and you make the fastest gains is, is, is initially anyway. So uh, asking you to don't worry about the effort too much, just go in there and learn. That's not going to realistically happen. So I think having some kind of basic template um, that, that puts you in the gym and gives you the constraints within to work hard and push, um, but never going past uh, the, the technical constraints, what we think is in the realm of appropriate or optimal um, is where I would start. And I think that's kind of like your, your basic stage. And then we move to where probably most people who are listening are dealing with people, uh, which would be, you know, like a novice bodybuilder or a novice lifter, if you will, an intermediate lifter and an advanced lifter. And the big picture variables that uh, need to be manipulated are volume, intensity, and frequency. So in the context of training for, for muscle size, I think the best way to define these, uh, these concepts is volume could be the number of sets per session or the number of sets per week per muscle group. I typically go with per week just because it helps with the construction of training. If we're making microcycles, like a week of training, mesocycles, a group of weeks of training for a distinct period with a, a clear end and, 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 and beginning, and then a macro cycle, which might be your whole, in the context of bodybuilding, your off season or your in season period or some of the transitions. So the uh, you, using like a week no, weekly sets per muscle group is a useful way to, to construct your training just as a heuristic. Um, intensity, I think for what we know that actually is the, the root causes of muscle size growing uh, is essentially uh, the weight on the bar to some degree matters, um, but more so it's about the effort level, ensuring that you're within a reasonable proximity of failure and the interaction of that with load and how many reps you're doing. So strength, it's very straightforward. If you want to get better at being stronger, you have to lift heavy things. And there's kind of no avoiding that. And uh, the beauty of anecdotes is that there's a saying, success leaves clues. And I think sometimes people will bastardize that saying and think, oh, that means I should emulate what people have done who are successful. But the clues that success actually leaves is you know that what they're doing at least doesn't impede the level of success they've achieved. It doesn't mean it's optimal. It doesn't mean it's necessary. In fact, most of the time, neither one of those is true. But you know that whatever they're doing is not preventing them from getting to where they are just by their existence. Um, so the, the, the fact that you can see bodybuilders who train heavy, bodybuilders who train light, high rep, low rep, et cetera, uh, and the fact that every single power lifter or Olympic lifter 
does maxes sometime or lifts very heavy. That tells you some of these things that the load on the bar is not quite as critical for bodybuilding, but the effort level is. And this comes down to how we recruit muscle mass. You know, if you lift something heavy, immediately everything's turned on. You can't produce as much volume per set or number of reps or time under tension, depending on how you're looking at it, because it's so heavy that it's near your max. You're going to get three, four, five reps. Uh, likewise, the first few reps or handful of reps in a set of 12 are going to be pretty easy because you haven't generated enough fatigue to get to the point where you're actually near failure. But in the end, whether you do a hard set of 12 or a hard set of five, you're going to be pretty much recruiting everything. And uh, the data we have now would suggest that hard sets within a reasonable rep range to produce enough volume per set are essentially equal in terms of hypertrophy stimulus. So anywhere with the majority of your training be between the six to 20 rep range, anywhere between say three, four reps from failure, all the way up to going to failure can fit within a program depending on the goals, the structure, and how you manipulate the other variables, you know, frequency and volume. If you're doing a very high volume, very high frequency program, you probably can't go to go to failure all the time and sustain that. Uh, likewise, if you're training the same muscle group very, very frequently, and you're training many, many, many times per week, you probably don't want to go to failure. But you can figure out a lower volume, moderate frequency approach going to failure, which is probably a little more common among bodybuilders, and that works just fine. So frequency uh, is simply how many times uh, in, a, in a microcycle you train a given muscle group in the context of bodybuilding. Intensity is probably best conceptualized as the rep range and distance from failure. And then volume is the total number of, of those hard sets. And I always like to think of uh, volume, intensity, and frequency as a triangle with like a fixed area. You can, you can lengthen one, one side of it, but it'll necessarily shorten the other. So you can have a high volume, high intensity program, but you're going to have to really drop frequency. You can have kind of a balanced program or you can emphasize one or two sides of it, uh, or maybe all three, but for a very short period. And that'd be like a pretty serious overreaching block, et cetera. So those are kind of the big picture concepts. And I think we have, um, the cultural roots of, of more is better and hard work is, is kind of the entrance into our club of bodybuilding. I mentioned that, that masochism uh, hook that originally got me. So you will typically see bodybuilders emphasize certain amounts, uh, certain, certain of these three variables in almost a non-negotiable way. Um, training at a high effort level is, is, is almost always going to be there. And that typically manifests as some of those counter arguments, the high volume camp or kind of the high intensity camp, the people who go to failure or past it or pre-exhaust so that the failure is even, even, even more quote unquote effective afterwards. Uh, if your typical icons are either Menser or Arnold, or you can think of, you know, Dorian and Lee Haney, it just depends on, on what area you're looking at. But um, over the course of a career, you really want to ensure that you're doing an appropriate amount to produce overload and not more than that so that you have more runway and that you're less likely to have burnout and that you're not uh, the hair and the proverbial turtle and hair scenario. I think what a lot of people do is they, they heap on so much training stimulus that they either have to take light weeks, uh, deloads pretty frequently, uh, or they're just in this kind of state of overtraining and it's not until a vacation or an injury or something makes them slow down, that they then kind of make some progress. And it's following the path of a moderation relative to where a bodybuilder needs to be at each stage that is probably going to get them there. In my experience, most novice bodybuilders have a lot more motivation and a willingness to work hard and push volume, push intensity than is necessary to create growth. And it's more uh, taking a measured approach until they get to the point where they need to do more to keep progress going because overload is harder and harder to come by. So essentially it's finding an appropriate setup of those three variables and then progressing them once you hit plateaus, making sure that you're actually plateaued for reasons of insufficient overload rather than too much overload, uh, kind of balancing fatigue and fitness. So I went a little bit all over the map, but essentially it's, it's getting in the realm of what we think makes sense, uh, setting it up to the individual's needs based on you know, their schedule and their individual characteristics, and then progressing at a points when plateaus happen as they get closer and closer to their genetic ceiling because gains are kind of like an asymptote, unfortunately, where you invest more and more and more and your returns get less and less and less. Well, in, in terms of a classic model, if, if we start back historically to the way a lot of people grew up or trained and then move it forward into today's much more research-based model, you know, I, I want to say first that I, I keep this kind of a chart handy whenever I'm describing training to people because it's, it's the classic training stimulus model. So, so here's where you train. 
you're going to cause enough metabolic disruption of the muscle cell that you, you create so that training response. And then of course there's some, some overcompensation here. So that's, that's normal. Then you want to train there. But if you train when you're not recovered, then you just keep going deeper, deeper, deeper into overtraining. But if you train with such hard intensity that you go deeper, it takes longer to recover, but then you get, you know, uh, ostensibly a little bit higher of a training response, uh, a corrective response. Now, the, the, the way historically people have dealt with that is to say, well, that's, that's great. I'm going to take all of, the, all of those variables <clears throat> and I'm going to make sure I cover them all in every workout. And so you start out with kind of a, a pyramiding rep scheme. So if today is back day or leg day or chest day, you know, I'm going to warm up and I'm going to go through and I'm, I'm doing sets of 20 and 15 and 12 and 10. And then eventually I will get to some level of, of maximum effort, wherever, wherever that I choose that to be do that for two or three exercises per body part, whatever your body part split is, you're done. And now the next day or the next day, you should, you should have some energy in the tank because you're now training a different body part. So you can let those worked body parts go through that recovery process. So all of us through history, it has just been a game of trying to see how can I manipulate all of those variables to the point where I maximize it. I get the best training response and I train again exactly at the pinnacle of recovery so that I can facilitate an even better response next time instead of going deeper into overtraining or just, just hitting those same plateaus over and over and not getting anywhere. So, you know, I, I wanted people to have a, a graphic representation of what it means, you know, what, why that training response and hitting it again is, is the important goal. But, in that classic scenario, you, you just create that, that same stale type of training where you're just going in, you're doing the old bro splits. Now that we spend a lot more time researching, what can you really do with those different variables? How, how much, instead of training just for strength or just power or just hypertrophy, how can you put together the best microcycles and mesocycles and macrocycles in blocks, to use your terminology, to progress into greater and greater gains. And as you mentioned, you know, that since the dawn of time, whenever somebody first realized that any kind of resistance creates a physical adaptation and somebody gets bigger and stronger, uh, that's been something we've, we've sought. So in, in your mind now, when you look at all the research that is out there, what do you think is the best way to, to use all of those variables? And you can go through them one at a time or, or continue with your triangle metaphor. But for those who do not have a PhD, uh, who are, are not necessarily, you know, looking at all of the data, all the research you do on a weekly basis, you know, how do you synthesize all that material down for the person just trying to get the best results? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good way of framing that. And I think, um, it's almost unavoidable for me not to provide some historical context here um, because there was uh, almost a, a pure form of, of bodybuilding that, that was around, and it's not even just bodybuilding, it's, it's strength and hypertrophy kind of focused. That came around the kind of the vaudeville era into, I would say, all the way up into the, the 50s, um, where it was pre uh, Medvedev, is pre periodization. Um, which periodization both caused problems and provided some new opportunities and perspectives for, for the goals of hypertrophy or for a bodybuilder. But before that, it was purely people just trying to get strong. And if you looked at like some of the circus vaudeville style early strongmen, they would just work up to a max and be strong. And then some of the guys who were displaying their physiques, one of the first being Sandow, they would also do some rep work, some calisthenics. And we've all seen how amazing gymnasts can look um, and started talking about nutrition. Um, and this became more and more, it crystallized more and more and more. And it was interesting, you know, we taught like kind of the stock standard bro split you mentioned now is something that was devised in the sixties. And it was when Weider came around and split off from Hoffman where Hoffman and the York gang always saw strength and size as kind of, you know, two sides of the same coin that one led to the other and vice versa. Uh, which is sort of accurate. And then Weider was like, look, we don't want to be the, the sideshow on Sunday after weightlifting comps. We want to build size for size's sake. And that's when the very muscle centric view uh, came like, let's train these body parts and recovery happens in isolated muscle groups uh, and rather than being systemic, et cetera. And that kind of conflicted with the emergence of periodization where it's like, all right, we're trying to peak for an athletic competition and on a known date. 
and power, uh, force times velocity or work over time is typically going to be the most important variable. So we want to basically potentiate each phase of training before that to get there. So we're going to do work capacity and hypertrophy, then we're going to do strength, and then we're going to do higher velocity power based work. Then we're going to do a deload or a taper as they call it, and then we're going to compete and I'll be in my best performance. Um, but that periodization model basically is not relevant for the goal of this being as big as possible. And it's only conditionally and, and partially relevant to the goal of just being really, really strong because you don't even finish in power. You'd want to finish in max strength. So, and I think a lot of that's not even necessarily relevant for the bodybuilder and some of the concepts of periodization, the element of period there of like thinking about how do I maximize my performance for, for you know, the next Olympic cycle, which is where the original roots of this came from, you know, Western periodization, looking at multi-month models of training for these different goals is not relevant. Um, what might be helpful are some of the concepts of programming, which are kind of the manipulations of variables on the microcycle and mesocycle level. And I think that's why when you walk into a gym and you ask somebody, hey, you know, what's your program? They'll tell you a split. They're essentially telling you a microcycle, how they organize their training. And that is maybe half of what you actually need to think about as a bodybuilder, in my opinion. Uh, and the all, only levels of periodization I think you really need to get into are almost emergent from the demands of contest prep off season and the necessary energy surplus and energy deficits you'll be in and the subsequent ability or inability to grow muscle, uh, loss of muscle, regaining it and getting out of a state of energy deficiency and, and all the hormonal adaptations that are not helpful to building muscle, but you need to experience to get shredded. And then trying to, you know, organize your training around that to elicit recovery and stay in the sport long term. So a lot of stuff I said there. Now, if we kind of went pre uh, the Weider split, because um, Weider split off from Hoffman and became a dominant force right around the 60s, right at the same time as Nautilus came out. And they started as a marketing uh, technique to promote machines, said, hey, the way to build muscle is isolation. You know, we need to be focusing on these. I've got these magic machines. They isolate things. That's going to be how you're going to grow and, and use these. And at the same time, anabolic steroids also hit the bodybuilding scene. So at the same time as now there's this cultural shift to where you can be a pure bodybuilder, isolation is important. We have these machines and also these drugs are going to accelerate your gains. It doesn't surprise me. And I think that's why the bro split has emerged as the most popular thing now. But if you were to look at the 50s and 40s competitors who were bodybuilders first, uh, maybe did some strength stuff because they were part of the, that, that community as well and they were seen as similar you would almost always see full body or upper body splits in these pre-steroid era, pre-isolation, what I would call dogma. Not that isolation isn't useful sometimes. Um, like if you wanted to build the best, you know, quads possible, I wouldn't just say do a whole, whole lot of squats. You might want to do some other things too. Um, you know, deadlifts, great overall bodybuilding movement, not great for like lat development, you know? Uh, so anyway, the point being is that we don't want to shift any dogma, but it's interesting that there was a point when almost every bodybuilder you could find trained full body or upper lower. Because now if we go all the way to the point now where we have enough, and if you go back to our discussion on uh, evidence-based practice, you have enough studies to actually meta-analyze and take kind of a, this, this bird's eye view of the data, some of the there are some minor issues that I do say minor that are, that are with the traditional bro split that typically you're only training a muscle group to any sufficient stimulus on a once per week basis. You can definitely set up a body part split to result in training each muscle group more than that. Um, you know, if you're doing close grip bench press on your arm day, and if you're doing, you know, underhand grip chins, you've just done chest and back as well. Well, let's say you do like chest and back, leg, shoulders, arms, repeat and take Sunday off. That's a two day per week, uh, you know, body part splits, nothing wrong with that. But there does seem to be, when you look at some of the, um, the meta-analyses, uh, some advantages to higher frequency training. Uh, so I would say the most consistent data would suggest that a higher frequency per muscle group or per movement allows you to have a lower per session volume, which may allow you to get more stimulus within a week. Um, and I would say that based on some of these meta-analyses and some of the ongoing meta-analyses that say James Krieger or Greg Knuckles have done that are kind of open access that you can see that aren't actually published, um, probably a higher frequency than once per week is where you get the majority of that, that benefit. And that a once per week training frequency kind of forces you into a corner of that pyramid or a shape of that, that, that triangle that I'm discussing uh, that, that, is, that is probably suboptimal. Um, now, that's 
confusing because almost every body, well, that's not true. A, one survey showed that two thirds of bodybuilders train each muscle group once per week. Uh, and we know the vast majority of like the, the legends, the stars of the IFBB do as well. And why is that? And I think it's exactly what you said is that the, the sports science perspective and the cultural the significance of being a bodybuilder, because bodybuilding didn't start as a sport, it started as a cultural phenomenon, if you really think about it, is all about effort and hard work. And the, the, the thing right in front of you that you're trying to work on is the training session. And how could you have a training session where you didn't work to your maximum capacity? And that's kind of going back to what I said earlier, you have people who have these multi-hour workouts with short rest periods, they're they're fighting, throwing up, uh, lots of volume, giant sets, supersets, sweat, you know, think of Arnold training and, and pumping iron, or you've got kind of the Mike Mentor archetype of you take that individual set to failure, pass failure, increase the load, beat the logbook, et cetera. Um, and there's value in both. But the interesting thing is that when you, when high volume or high intensity is non-negotiable, the one thing that we discussed earlier is you must use a lower frequency. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's a tough sell sometimes when I tell someone that you might get better total gains if we take not just a look at the single session, but the aggregate stimulus over a microcycle or a mesocycle. And I say, yeah, you might get less stress per set or even less stress per workout, but per microcycle, it's a better management tool for the overall stimulus. And that's hard to get experientially and only emerges when we look at a lot of data. Um, and it's something that was culturally understood in the 40s, 50s, 30s, and 20s when everyone seemed to train full body uh, and there was less of an emphasis on masochism and they were much more focused on the fact that I am getting stronger and I'm using a multitude of exercises and a multitude of rep ranges and I happen to be, you know, big and jack like John Grimmick, for example. So the, what we've seen from these meta-analyses on volume, intensity, and frequency, when you kind of group them together, uh, the, the rough place I start with, if someone comes to me and they've got no background data, so I don't know any individual differences that would push them outside of the bell curve, is I'm probably going to set them up to train each muscle group at least twice per week. We'll take a look now, at how often agree, they can get to the gym. Let me interrupt for a second. Would you yep. agree that the data does support twice a week is, is optimal? Uh, no, I would say that the only thing the data would support, and this, this is, again, it's actually quite low on the totem pole. The primary utility of higher frequency is to use higher volumes because it does seem that you get diminishing returns with doing too much volume in a single session, and volume is highly related to uh, the stimulus, right? Um, so I would say what, what the data is pretty clear on is that too low of a frequency, you run into problems. And probably where that cutoff is, is training once per week. So I think two, training each muscle group two, three, four, five, six, even seven times a week can work. It just becomes a little silly when you get out. Like when you start training seven times a week, you basically got an exercise per muscle group, you know, because then, and, and then two to three sets. So you're doing 14 to 21 sets per, per exercise spread across the week. So I would say the only thing you don't want to do is set up a training program, unless you have prior data that shows you just do better with this where you're only training each muscle group, even considering overlap, uh, just, just, just once per week or less. Um, because due to things like the repeated bout effect, your ability to uh, cause damage and then recover from it quickly, that ends up being a, it, it's a, it's a poor trade-off. So muscle damage is part and parcel of overload. If you're creating overload or an organic system, you're gonna create some muscle damage, but damage is not the same thing as growth. And you can get your body better at regenerating damage, which is important because there is some data to suggest that the, the, the machinery that actually synthesizes new proteins, uh, that isn't just to regenerate, it's actually creating new muscle tissue, it puts that as on the back burner until damage is recovered. And one of the key elements of your body getting good at repairing damage, so then it can get to hypertrophy, is frequency. If it knows that a certain damaging stimulus is coming regularly, it gets quite robust at preventing damage. That's the repeated bout effect. Um, so we want to elicit that to some degree. And if you, anyone has probably experienced that if they rotated in an exercise they haven't done in a really long time, or if they took a couple of weeks off and got back to the gym, uh, that, oh my God, the soreness reminded them of when they first stepped in the gym. Um, so we want to have a controlled amount of muscle damage, uh, sufficient muscle damage to produce overload that is unavoidable, but measurable detrimental muscle damage that, that you're sore going into your next training or that changes your movement patterns, um, or that's just really high in general has been shown to 
impede the, the effectiveness of your next training session. And it's kind of like, just like you showed in your chart, uh, it's the, not the systemic, but it's at least the local or peripheral factors of recovery uh, that, that you may be not, you know, like it's nothing wrong with your biceps are sore training biceps again. You'll probably notice that the next time you train biceps, they're even less sore because your body's going, oh, okay, we've got even more damage to repair. It gets good at that. Um, but kind of the, the quote unquote sweet spot where you can keep damage under control and get the most stimulative blips within a given time. It's trying to get the most density, the most area under the curve in a given time point of stimulus for hypertrophy probably comes somewhere after you're only training each muscle group once per week. So that might be, you know, you could have that body part split I talked about. You can go legs, shoulders, arm, chest, and back, take a day off, then go upper, lower, then take another day off. Um, or you can just go upper, lower in, in a higher rep range, day off, upper, lower, and a lower rep range, two days off on the weekend and get back after it. There's not infinite, but there's many ways to set things up to where you're training things at least twice per week. You can do full body three days a week. Um, you know, there become practical considerations, uh, but you get a broad range of areas you can work with them. Um, so and so a, common, a, a common split that I see today, uh, you know, a, a lot of competitors will come to me and say, okay, here's what I'm doing because coach so-and-so had me do it. And it's an upper lower split where it's upper lower day off upper lower. So they mm -hmm. are, they are doing their entire body, you know, twice a week. Now the, the variables of intensity within each workout and the, the actual exercises done, you know, may be different. But within that framework, are you saying that that, that would be optimal or, or you think that may still be too much volume? No, I think that that is definitely within the realm of what could absolutely work just fine. Yeah, I mean, the beauty of hypertrophy is that it's actually a very forgiving adaptation. Um, there are a lot of things you can do. The world is almost your oyster. You know, like you can set up a ton of different splits. I think for let's say someone who's relatively new to their career of bodybuilding, you could train two to six days per week and it could all be considered optimal. The point is, is that the, the differences between these programs, uh, if we set them up right and really, I mean, it's extreme ends of two or six, you have to really think about exercise selection, rest periods, how you, how you set it up in, in these given workouts, but they could all be in the realm of what we can effectively measure to be optimal. They would produce probably similar outcomes if they were, you know, volume and intensity equated. In terms of um, what you're describing there is optimal hypertrophy, multiple, yes. multiple ways of training to get optimal hypertrophy. And as you said, I, I like the way you said it's a very forgiving variable. Uh, what a lot of people don't understand is as long as you have a nerve supply, uh, that is the most critical thing and the right nutrition, then yeah, a, a lot of different variables within your training style can create massive hypertrophy. I mean, you see, you know, CrossFitters down to powerlifters mm -hmm. and, and, and like you said, even gymnasts. And you know, a gymnast is not in the gym doing some kind of a Romanian, you know, training split for strength and yet look at their physiques. Yep. Well said. And I think, um, it's, it's useful to understand what hypertrophy is because if you just get a textbook, like if I just grab the NSCA textbook right here and I opened it up, you would see, you know, manipulating training variables for hypertrophy, muscular endurance, maximal strength or power. And that construct that heuristic is very useful to give you tools to actually write a program but it also gives the false impression that these are all very similar types of adaptations in our body like they're they're different things that happen when you put in a stimulus um, but they are shared in many ways and i think hypertrophy is a bit of a different one in that um, we're survival machines right so sometime you know caveman eric is getting chased by you know another tribe or a saber tooth tiger and me being able to run outrun them for a longer distance, uh, climb faster, jump higher or fight them off, help me survive. But having a jacked upper chest probably wasn't a large part of my selective pressure as a human. Um, hypertrophy is kind of the combined factors of getting bigger muscles to produce more force and having a greater metabolic ability to do more work. So hypertrophy, when we look at the related training variables, has to do with you know, sufficient load and effort, which like I said, it's got a pretty broad variable, and then sufficient dosage of that effort and load. So it's kind of like you, the combination of muscular endurance and strength, and that's the physical manifestation of some of the ways we drive that, you know, uh, increasing exactly. the contractile tissue and providing more uh, substrate to contract. And that's what we see as, as, as bro, nice packs. You know. Well, well I, I'm laughing because as somebody who's taken several courses through several universities in evolutionary biology, I would say that there is some sex selection in terms of, of how you do look 
And so, so the better genes for hypertrophy have been passed along due to mate selection. Um, Actually, so it's, that's not really all just for, it's not all just for fighting saber tooth yeah. tigers. My friend. So tiny little tangent. There is a study showing that more muscular men are more attractive to women, yeah. but it's but muscular right. is all based on what your your uh, like your 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 point is. And if you look at that specific study that bodybuilders love to throw up there, because uh, they you know the, the masculinity is in crisis. Look, women want men to be men. You know, like that whole thing and, and all that. It's I find it hilarious because you look at the study and like the the muscular guy looks like, like not red quite red. like. Like Brad Pitt, exactly. Yeah. You know, like, like yeah, do some push-ups. You know, like so. Uh, it's not even like like the, your average. You know, fifth place in the novice class in the natural bodybuilding show in the middles. Too muscular. You okay, know, that. touche. So. You, you got me. I was trying to pull out some Darwin on you. You, you got me. Um, let's let's talk about this because I I I see in the industry right now as a clinician, I, I see a lot of people who are taking advantage of the proliferation of coaches out there. And so nobody will compete without having a nutrition coach. Nobody will go through the off season without some kind of a strength training coach. And so while all that is great, uh, unbelievable service to have in your corner, I see a lot of people just becoming dependent on those services and, and they're eliminating their critical thinking. They're, they're mm -hmm. losing their ability to be curious and test things out themselves. They're not exploring in the gym like we used to have to do. And uh, I, I want to make sure for those people who really just don't look deeply at these variables, that they understand that they are still their own best researchers. Their, their lab is their body, is in the gym. And so, you know, to those people, when you're saying, look, here, here are the kinds of training splits that you may read about, you, they're, they're recommended to you, coaches may prescribe them for you but here's how you have to maximize them best in the gym. You know, talk for just a couple of minutes to wrap up, Eric. You know, what does high intensity constitute? What, what are those other variables when it comes to frequency? When, when should you know to just take an extra day off even if it wasn't scheduled? Or, you know, I, I just want for that layman who is just mm. really confused by what they read out there now to, to have a better grasp. Yeah, this all comes from the, the inappropriate juxtaposition of quote unquote, bro science, which is basically just become a catch all for old science. Uh, and also here's what I found work for me, bro. And they dismiss that, uh, training exercise science is actually a really poor replacement for here's what worked for me. Uh, science is about means averages and kind of these broad brush strokes. So I think somewhere you kind of start within that, that range I gave, which just as a real brief review, if we talk about volume, intensity and frequency, as long as you're hitting everything at least twice per week, any split could be optimal for you, uh, for you being a key variable ta I'll talk about. As uh, long as you're in like say the 6 to 20 rep range most of the time and that you're getting in a reasonable proximity to failure, um, not necessarily always training to failure, that's totally fine. And then, uh, you know, that kind of takes care of both effort and, and load because load is going to be rep range dependent. Um, and so long as you're doing anywhere in the range of 10 to 20 sets per muscle group that are of, of that uh, description, that could be optimal for you. And then it all comes down to paying attention uh, and not buying into dogma, but the becoming your own case study of one. And what I mean by paying attention is how do you know if you're progressing? Um, and, you know, I think a great example of how the community has become much more educated. I used to start seminars when I talk about training for bodybuilding, but I ask people, how do you know you had a good workout? And most of the answers I, I would get were all these kind of subjective descriptions of either a pump being wrecked or being sore the next day. Um, and rarely would I get anything about uh, beating the logbook in some, in some fashion. Now that's changed. And now I've almost had to push back the other way with being like, hey, it's not all just about load. So I will say that if you set up those constraints and you are seeing progress across multiple exercises for multiple muscle groups in multiple rep ranges, you're almost invariably stimulating hypertrophy because muscle size, like we talked about kind of Dar Darwin-y, is, is one of the components to strength. You know, more contractile tissue should allow you all else equal to produce more force. Not always in every single case. Uh, it's not directly causative, but it is one of the components of the multi-component model of strength. So your performance improving is your best 
the, your closest thing looking into the black box of whether or not I'm getting bigger. Obviously, if you measure your arms or if you get a DEXA scan regularly or something like that, and of course, these are actually fraught with errors, I don't recommend that, or you see yourself getting bigger or your shirt, your clothes are fitting tighter, that's great. But you're going to get to a point where, uh, just, just for an example, even an intermediate bodybuilder may need to wait three to four mesocycles before they can visually see a change uh, in, in their body, um, which is the whole reason it's so fun to try to program this stuff. So how do you know, like for 12, 16 weeks, what, whether that was effective? Um, you can't just be like, well, I wasn't, I wasn't bigger after chest today, so that didn't work. Um, you have to actually have some objective metrics. So I think your, your key tool is, am I progressing? Because if you are overtraining, performance will fall off. And if you are undertraining, performance will also not progress. Uh, so it's the key ability to determine what might be the cause of that. So I normally create a flow chart to help someone once they've set up kind of this thing within the realm of optimal and they're going out there and they're in the gym and they're doing it, uh, kind of the flow chart is, all right, am I plateaued? And a plateau is not defined as you're not progressing as fast as you want because the grass is always greener. But on the majority of your movements, you're not able to add a rep or add load. Um, and if that is the case and it's occurred for, let's say, a full mesocycle, it's, you know, three or four weeks sometimes, that might be time to get into the hood and change something. And that's when you have to assess, all right, is this a under recovery issue or is this an overtraining issue broadly? Um, so kind of the checklist I like to go through is we assess sleep. Are you getting at least eight hours? Are you getting at least, you know, say 0.7 grams per pound of, of protein, like a reasonably high protein diet? Are you consuming sufficient energy? Are you in an energy deficit? You probably want to, want to correct that because uh, that's going to be a pretty big bottleneck, bottleneck to creating new tissue. Um, are you managing stress in your life? You know, like, so basically, are you handling all the things you can on the recovery side of the equation? If yes, and you're still not progressed, all right, how do you feel? Are you, are you just feel wrecked in the gym or you feel fresh and fine? Uh, if everything's checked and you feel wrecked, it probably means that you need to either take some kind of cyclical deload, an acute deload, or reduce the overall training stress in one of those three parts of that triangle in some manner. Uh, but if you feel fresh, you're fine, you've checked all those boxes, and you're still not progressing, you probably just need to do more. Um, and that, that's, uh, that could be done through increasing volume. Uh, that could be done if you are someone who always stays a little bit far away from failure. Uh, you know, train with a partner, take some video. If it looks like you're not actually pushing those sets at a high enough intensity, you might be in the, the, the relatively rare but still existing camp of bodybuilders who is maybe too cerebral, too focused on the numbers, and not actually pushing, uh, you know, close enough to failure to get that muscle recruitment. So I think uh, that that's kind of the checklist I like to go through. Um, and then just really don't get locked into dogma. Like, like, like you said, Dr. Joe, there's so many different programs you can see out there and we've kind of lost experimentation. Uh, you know, scientific principles and evidence-based voices are not supposed to replace the underlying philosophy of observation, curiosity, open-mindedness, and trying out, there's a sweet spot between being a rigid, overly analytical, I only want to do what I've convinced myself is optimal and program hopping. And that's self-experimentation, which I see as an investment. You may go through, like for example, I'll give you a really concrete one. For, through 2016, 2017, and 2018, I played with different variations on body part splits, upper, lower, and full body approaches, quote unquote full body. I'm not necessarily doing a set for every single muscle group every single time, but basically no restriction on what I could train in a day. And I eventually landed on an individualized full body-ish split uh, because I need a whole lot less volume for my legs to grow and they're a dominant feature in my physique, but I can take and I need a whole bunch of volume and a lot of different exercises for my upper body. So it kind of looks like I go in there and I do some lower body movement and then a crap ton of upper body. So that is almost full body, but we don't have a great description for it. And I landed on that only through spending about a year and a half doing what was necessarily suboptimal work until I figured out what was optimal for me. And I think a lot of people get this paralysis by analysis. They want to look outward to try to figure out what is optimal for them as a unique human. Uh, and they, they simply, you simply can't do that. I think at best you can kind of get to like a B or a B plus for you using these evidence-based, you know, mean based descriptions that we have. And then to get from the B category to an A for you, it's figuring out how to individualize those. And that's going to take, an investment, months, paying attention, careful notes. What rate did I progress? How did I feel? Was I sleeping well? Uh, when everything was, was perfect, how quickly could I progress my lifts? Which movements didn't progress and which ones did? Oh, okay, now I have disparities on which muscle groups need to 
do this. Okay, if I do need to put a whole lot of volume in my legs, damn it, that creates a whole bunch of systemic stress. Maybe I need to do a specialization cycle. All of these kind of if-then statements and intellectual exercises I'm going through of self-observation takes time and it takes paying attention. And I think if you're someone who just really likes to have answers, I get it. That's why you follow science-based stuff. But those answers aren't going to come external. They'll kind of get you to the start of the race, but then you really got to run your own race. I, I'm really glad you took the time to explain your answer that carefully because a, a lot of people do forget how much individualized uh, everybody's results can be. So, so similar to you, um, I, I have done two year-long bouts of vegetarianism with full blood panels, body comp analysis. I've, I've tested keto versus non-keto in the same way. Every kind of training split you could do. I, ha I have binders this thick with all of my training logs because for 30, now actually 40 years, I have done the same thing. It has all been everything I can learn out there, all the research, all of the, the information, but then I'm going to test it in the quote lab, meaning my mm -hmm. own body, my own gym. And I mean, that's how you figure out what's going to work best for you. 100%. Well said. Yeah. So, so last question, I want to get you uh, to, to answer this in one single sentence. So it's going to be kind of a, a, of a teaser, but because you are in the know in research, you survey a lot of, of data coming out. You, you know, a lot of the researchers personally, is there one area that you see, wow, this is the next frontier. This is what we're going to explore and we're going to find some amazing stuff out if we just find this answer. Yeah. The, the answer that I'm really curious about is why we stop growing. Um, we all know that we do. We all know that you hit a ceiling and, um, you know, we know the answer for our IPB pros, right? They've, they're doing everything they, they can to their best of their knowledge for nutrition and training, and then they just up the dose. But why does a drug-free lifter stop growing? You know, is this, and there's been some interesting conceptual nuggets that have looked at this and some mechanistic things. Like there was a, a recent study that came out that found um, the increased production of ribosomes, which is some of the machinery in our cell, which could be a limiting factor and why some people respond better to high volume. There was a study that showed the people who responded best to higher volume had greater ribosomal capacity or greater ribosomal biogenesis in the cells. Okay, we follow that, that pathway down. Um, there's some interesting analyses that look at sarcopenia and osteopenia and how they might be related. So one thing that maybe we haven't thought about is, all right, well, is the limiting factor for my muscle size, potentially my, my skeletal strength or my connective tissue strength, you know, like the most compressive force a bone gets is when the two ends of it contract towards each other, you know? So do we try, need to try to do maybe some plyometrics or some heavy axial loading to try to increase our bone density to try to then, you know, keep, keep muscle growth going? Or is it a, uh, like Greg, Greg Knuckles has talked about, is it a, prom, a problem of, of geometry and, and blood flow? Like as, as a muscle gets bigger, it's hard to deliver nutrients to it. So maybe doing something to enhance like, capillary density or the effectiveness of blood, blood flow at the microvasculature would, would allow us to deliver more nutrients to get past that uh, geometrical problem? Or is it that we need to be thinking about myonuclear domain theory or inducing hyperplasia to get, you know, how do we get past this, the ceiling we have now? Is it a real ceiling or is it a ceiling that is induced by the way we do things and we haven't questioned certain assumptions? So that's really what I'm interested in is figuring out mechanistically, why do we stop growing? Because then if there are avenues for advanced lifters to get even bigger, we have to know what's stopping us, right? To actually surmount that, that obstacle. Well, so, so my, no, now you're in the realm of evolution again, which I love because you know, as, as we know that we have more neurons in our gut than we have in our brain. So a lot of people call mm. that the enteric brain or the second brain. Uh, octopuses have three brains, uh, or I'm sorry, three, three hearts and nine brains. So uh, a lot of things, absolutely. Who, who knows what we're going to look like in another uh, 100,000 years. But uh, you will There's probably be the genetics. cause. That I know. <laughs> you, you will look back. There, there will be like Darwin, Helms, et cetera. That's right. It was these revolutionary biologists and then this dude who studied people in Speedos. And he was <laughs> the transhumanist uh, messiah that, that we didn't know at the time. Yeah. The, the, the biohacker to be. <laughs> All right, Dr. Eric Helms, thank you so much for being a part of Contest Prep University again. This is going to be, as I said, the third part of a three-part series on training design, training research, and uh, you have just articulated it perfectly. So thank you for your time. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right, guys, and those of you watching, listening, Contest Prep University, stay tuned. We will bring more features to you and our normal daily podcast. We'll see you next time.